welcome to my podcast. My name is Barbara Radzavigas and this is Bondi Crafters. It's the 1st of May and we are going to see May Gibbs House. It's on the other side of Sydney, North Sydney. And so we are off today. <laughs> I love the gift shop.
she passed away when she was 92 wow. um, and she lived and worked here um, she lived here with her husband um, and um, I'll show you the different rooms as we go through uh, so she was born in England actually she, and her family immigrated to Australia when she was four years old um, so they boarded a ship and they came to Australia um, they first tried their hand at farming they thought they'd come and farm um, in Adelaide um, but uh, the conditions weren't very good um, and then they moved to Perth and eventually settled there. Um, both her parents were actually trained artists um, and they were very creative and so when they moved to Perth they were quite involved in setting up the arts community in Perth um, of which May was a big part of her childhood as well. So she was involved in um, musicals and plays and art exhibitions. Um, her father um, with some friends um, made their own satirical magazines with lots of illustrations and comics inside. So um, she got, would have got lots of inspiration from her, fa from her family when she was young. Um, so she won her first art prize when she was just a teenager for her botanical drawings. Um, and so when she finished high school, she decided that she would follow in her parents' footsteps and study to be an artist as well. So she went back to London to study um, and she went back and forth three times over seven years. Um, the this, this story goes apparently that she used to get to London, her mum had set her up in an apartment, um, and then she would work so hard going to art school in the day and then art classes at night that she, would, uh, she wouldn't eat properly and she was just all consumed by her work that she would run herself there <laughs> and her mum would have to come and pick her up, bring her back to Australia, rehabilitate her, and then she'd go back again. Wow. So it took her seven years to finish her degree. Um, when she finished, she came back to Australia. She brought her best friend, Renee, with her, um, and they were drawn to Sydney's bohemian lifestyle in the 1920s, so they moved here from Perth. Um, uh, their, the block of land was found by May's mother, um, May and um, Renee and then her husband John, they were all, they were renting in Neutral Bay um, and so they wanted to live here. They found the block of land um, and May actually met the architect whose name is BJ Waterhouse on the ferry. Um, she used to catch the ferry into the studio in the city um, and so she asked him to design a house for her and she gave him three requirements which was convenience, um, compactness, charm. So when we go through, keep those three in mind, see if you think that he did a good job. Um, so the block of land was vacant here. The two houses either side were already here um, when, when Nutcote was built. You can see this is quite a large house on the right and this was actually a mansion originally on this side. Um, the gift shop which you came through on your way in was actually the original double garage. Um, and then below the gift shop where we have our tea room and toilets, that was self-contained accommodation and um, that used to be rented out um, for extra income. But they um, owned it, she owned it. She owned that, yeah, this was yeah. all, yeah, yeah. property, yeah. Um, so May married quite late in life. She was 40 when she got married with the two, so, sorry, with the two. And so she didn't have any children of her own. So when she passed away, she left everything to charity. She left the rights to all her um, illustrations and her works so, um, to two children's charities. Um, she left the house here, Nutcote, to UNICEF, and she had a block of land in the Blue Mountains that she left to the RSPCA. Wow. Um, fortunately, the UNICEF were not allowed to keep property, um, and so they had to sell Nutcote, and it was sold in the 70s um, to a developer and the developer was going to demolish the building and develop the whole block. Um, but he sat, on the, he sat on it for quite a long time. It was, it was unused, unlived in. Um, and in that time, 
friends of May's and people who admired her work formed the Nutcote Trust and the Friends of Nutcote and they started to campaign, fundraise and petition to save Nutcote from being um, demolished. Um, so it took them quite a long time and it wasn't until 1990 that um, council, the local council eventually said we'll buy the property without any federal support. And so um, North Sydney Council owns the property today and it's still run by the um, Nutcote Trust. So um, all the people you see here working here are volunteers. We have volunteer gardeners who look after the garden, um, volunteers in our tea room and volunteer guides as well. Um, Lovely and cool inside here, isn't it? Yeah, 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 it's lovely. So you can sit on any of the chairs in here, just uh, the black chairs or the bench seat if you like, just not the wood, the one here. So come on, this is the main living room. Um, so BJ Waterhouse, the architect, um, was quite prominent in this area and he built mostly arts and crafts style houses. This is a bit of um, a detour on that style. It's classified more as a Mediterranean style and we can see that from the stucco outside and, and the, um, the deep balcony and arches outside. Um, originally the architect wanted to put a second story on the house which would have given us a beautiful view from the top but you can see what they gained by not putting that second story on was having this gorgeous high ceiling in this main room. Um, so this is the, in this room you can see the whole width of the house. So it is not very wide, so compact, yes, with tick, um, and convenience and charm are the other two. So um, you'll notice May was a very practical woman. She didn't want to waste space on things she didn't need. Um, as we walk through, have a look, you'll notice Aside from this little front entry and a little one over here, there's, there's not really any hallways. All the rooms just connect through to each other, so there was no wasted space. Um, so this was their main living room. Um, a feature of the architect were these arched windows with the panelling, and you can see how he's mirrored those back and, back and forth on each side. Um, so May and her husband, John, spent a lot of time in this room. They, um, they used to listen to the radio. They loved to listen to the cricket in summer. Um, they'd play cards, they had their fireplace, no TV back then. Um, for music they had their gramophone um, and of course they had a piano. And this is a very special piano, it's a pianola which is very popular in the 20s. So for those who don't know you put these rolls in and you pedal on the bottom. Um, they could actually play the piano and the violin, she didn't need the pianola but it's lots of fun. Um, so they um, she loved to read National Geographic magazine, so we put some of those on the shelf. Um, when the house was sold, um, a lot of the furniture was auctioned off, and then we thought there was a list of everything. So um, the books on the bookshelves are the titles that we know that May had at the time, which is really lovely. Um, and I'll point out the, some of the original furniture has been returned, so I can point that out to you. Okay, Dom.
This is so beautiful. It's got a trumpet tree. Beautiful little courtyard, terraced. And a boathouse. And a beautiful view of Sydney Harbour. Although it didn't look like that in the 1920s. How beautiful. There's the Harbour Bridge through there. We are home. It was a wonderful day out. If you like uh, my video, please like and subscribe. If you're ever in Sydney, May Gibbs House is a fab place to visit. She was a, an amazing Australian, 1920s and 30s in Sydney. Um, she loves Scotty dogs. <laughs> so, yeah, that's it for me. Signing off.